Hello and welcome to Magda Talk Series. We're in conversation with Kevin Abosh, Irish conceptual artist known for his works in photography, sculpture, installation, AI, blockchain and film. Abosh's work addresses the nature of identity, value and human currency and has been exhibited throughout the world, often in civic spaces. In this talk, you hear about one of his recent work, N95, and the impact that COVID-19 has been having on art and the community. Enjoy the talk. Hey, hello. Hi, how are you? I'm all right. How are you doing? Uh, doing well. It's a, gr it's a gloomy day today. Yesterday was rather sunny. Today's gloomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty sunny here, but I heard we had some snow back in Italy. So, yeah, <laughs> weird. Yeah. The numbers are bad in Italy again today. I know. It's crazy. It's so depressing. Boring, yeah. boring, Boris Johnson is having a talk right now. Um, but yeah, I'll uh, watch it afterwards. <laughs> that can wait. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Thank you for joining me this evening. And um, it's really nice to have you on this call. And thank you for supporting this project. Um, sure. I, I was very much impressed by your latest work, the N95 um, which is the one that we've posted today because it's sort of uh, pictures and frames what we are currently living. Um, so yeah, I would like to have a chat with you about what you're experiencing as an artist and also how does that reflect on the art that you're creating um, around these days? Sure. Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, some of the ways it affects me are as an artist, other ways as a, as a father, other ways as just a human being. Um, yeah. My wife is a doctor. She's on the front lines, uh, essentially fighting uh, here in New York City, where we've been declared the epicenter of the uh, United States. I think yeah. yesterday, like 56% of the cases um, in America are in New York City itself. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you know, we're like so many people kind of quarantined at home. Uh, we made the choice to take our, our two sons out of school um, a couple weeks actually before mm -hmm. uh, it, it was suggested, uh, which quite frankly, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled about. That's one positive yeah. thing is I realize uh, how inefficient uh, the, the schools are. Where I, think they're, I think they've learned more in two weeks than they have in like a year in school. Uh, so that's that's one positive. But, you know, um, right before this sort of really started to take hold, um, I, I was part of a group show in Paris at, uh, at Jeux de Pomme uh, called the Supermarché des Images, the Supermarket of Images. Yeah. Uh, a really one of my favorite institutions um, with some with great company. Uh, and uh, and I think it was up for about a month before the show. It was supposed to be up till June. So just like most museums in major cities, it's closed now. Yeah, I'm just That's, looking uh, at it on the, on the website, yes. Yeah, not, uh, I mean, it doesn't really affect me, you know, in mm -hmm. any meaningful way, but it's notable that, you know, I can imagine if, if I were a younger artist and I had just managed to have a show there, I'd be like, oh, damn it, I've got a show and nobody can even see it. <laughs> I think a lot of people are in that position right now, mm -hmm. but I think also exploring the online and what's available um, within the online space is also quite important. And um, Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to see, see that your initiative, uh, I mean, I, I pretty much all day long, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing uh, uh, some form of, of, a, of a community taking <laughs> shape um, and, uh, you know, trying to fill the void uh, of what would normally take place, you know, uh, in person. Um, I know, uh, you know, Elena uh, from Kadaf, and I know they're, they're uh, working on some stuff. And, um, yeah. But it, I mean, it's, 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 it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's, it's in a way best suited for art that uh, maybe exists in the digital space to begin with. <laughs> you know, maybe, uh, you know, but, um, you know, nothing for me anyway replaces, you know, a proper vernissage and, you know, meeting with, uh, meeting face to face with people. But I mean, this is great. I mean, like, you know, I don't know if this is any, uh, uh, if there's any less value with this than if we met at a, you know, cafe in New York or London, 
<laughs> I think there's a right. I mean, you're, you you've probably been doing this a little bit more, more than I have, but I mean, I, I, I very quickly it's sort of my room melts away, and this just becomes uh, you know this common space and. Uh, provided my kids stay upstairs, it's, it's going to stay peaceful. <laughs> I find that, you know, talking to artists and people throughout these days has um, sort of made us feel closer to each other. And mm. the support, um, I think, has been very refreshing for a lot of people and meant a lot in terms of like mental health, but also keeping the creativity, you know, still running. Because um, it can feel draining and it can feel frustrating, especially if you're working on a show, something that you want so much to be exhibiting. Um, but at the same time, sort of breaking this um, silence and also this feeling of uh, uncertainty about the future and what it may be like after uh, COVID-19. Um, I think it's quite important and uh, keeping us connected as well and exploring new ways of seeing art and communicating with each other. So it's quite nice to, to be here, you know, in our rooms and, uh, and share our intimacies in a way um, with other people. So, um, exactly. yeah, it's, I think it's even more uh, special um, because when you go and see an exhibition or an artwork, um, you feel somehow influenced by the surrounding or what mm. the space um, um, has hold, you know, in terms of the history of the space mm. and the um, uh, opinions of others surrounding you, uh, where this space in a way can be even more confidential um, and, and open up new opportunities mm. of communicating. So, so yes, quite interesting, yes. Um, yeah. I wanted to uh, perhaps talk about some of your latest works and how you came to, to create them and what mm. it meant for you. Um, so yes, as I was referring to N95, uh, which is the photograph of the mask, um, the face mask. Um, but I was also curious about the works that we briefly discussed yesterday. Um, mm. So the nation space that you mentioned about the use of technology and how you um, sure. communicate with technology yeah. in that sense. And and so uh, I, so with respect to technology, I've always said you know photography is technology as well. I mean I I think mm -hmm. that um, I've gone through periods of my career where I've um, I've sort of focused on photography, where I've moved away from it, where I've combined it with with uh, with other methods. Um, but first and foremost, I mean photography is a technology. Um, I I take uh, images of of objects, also people's faces, but. But for me, um, these objects uh, are not really meant to be taken at face value ever. Um, mm -hmm. I'm interested in using them as proxies to distill higher concepts, uh, emotional um, value, uh, uh, frequently around sociologic dilemma. Um, and in the case of N95, you know, the object is... Uh, I, I don't want to call it, it's, it, it's, it's very, it's very common, right? It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's very obvious, right? It's a very obvious symbol. And sometimes I feel like sometimes artists, I'll, I speak for myself, I won't speak for all artists, but you know, sometimes uh, I find myself uh, over the years trying to come up with something novel no pun mm -hmm. intended, by the way, um, but uh, something novel, uh, something maybe, you know, that, uh, you know, haven't seen somebody, haven't seen somebody else do, or you know, because I think as an artist you do that. You know, you, know, you come up with mm -hmm. an idea, and however it sort of manifests, you're like, oh my god, that looks too much like this, or like that, or like you know, and and even if you're coming from a completely different angle, you're you're concerned about how um, people might perceive it and think it's derivative uh, when it's not, you know. So, so, uh, but I have I kind of have a history of taking I think objects um, mm -hmm. that are very commonplace. And uh, not necessarily, I used to think like kind of imbuing them with importance, which you do in a sense, just by deciding that it is the subject of your work uh, mm -hmm. and then presenting it some, you know, on a wall, uh, sometimes these objects and larger than life. So in one sense, I, I, I used to think that I'm, I'm paying, I'm honoring something that maybe has been, um, uh, not uh, given its due, but 
actually it's more about it's more about pre presenting an object in a way that it transcends its superficiality and mm -hmm. really serves as a proxy to move people emotionally. Um, I mean, and this, when you see it, I mean, I think I'll speak for myself. So, I mean, also, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know again about other artists. I'm not somebody who like loves all my work. <laughs> you know, um, I would say a, a very small percentage of my own work do I want to see on the wall, um, you know, of my own place. Uh, that's a piece that I actually would. Um, you know, I, it speaks to life, it speaks to death, it speaks to uh, the struggle to survive. Um, and I mean, it's so interesting that those, uh, you know, N95, that alphanumeric of three characters, uh, it's, it's all over the world now. People know, know they know what those, those three alphanumerics mean. Um, and they're charged with whew, like a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, life and death, you know, that's, 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 um, and so it's much more than the object itself and its practical uh, intent. And, uh, you know, I, I think I, I think I already, <laughs> I was thinking about it, but I, well, that actually went to good use. I'll have to say that that actually, that actually, uh, that mask ended up uh, going to good use. My wife, uh, you know, <laughs> got some practical use out of it. But people, uh, you know, an old, an, an image I took of a potato years ago, people always ask me yeah. what happened to the potato. And regretfully, it didn't get eaten. I felt kind of uh, awful about that. I so actually at least, wondered about that. Oh, yeah. No, so this didn't go to waste. Uh, this was, uh, even if you uh, don't like the art, uh, don't worry. Uh, no, no masks were, were injured or in, in, the, in the course of doing this, uh, this work. No, but I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah. So on the one hand, it's very obvious. But on the other hand, I think, uh, you know, it's something that a few years later we'll look back on and, Hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. What I wanted to, to say is that when I first saw this work in 95, to me, was um, very clear the, um, that what we're living right now is something that will probably go down to history and people will read in 50 and 100 years time in books. And it's hard to imagine. But that sure. picture exactly was um, the symbol of this time. And as I was seeing a picture on um, an Italian newspaper with the military trucks mm -hmm. carrying bodies out of mm -hmm. the city of Milan because there were far too many. And so thinking that a lot of people have died without even having the dearest ones close to them, mm -hmm. it's uh, horrible. And, um, you know, when I saw this photograph um, of your work, um, that pictured in one frame the whole situation and in a way is also seeing the strings hanging you know it makes me feel that there's life beyond what it's happening right now even though there's a person missing there's a there's a life beyond and that we you know, go through this it's that's, interesting that's yeah, what it communicated to me the I fact like that, that I, somebody I like was that. missing it was actually stronger powerful um, and it gave hope in a way. So strangely, uh, and I, I, I hear you, strangely, it didn't even occur to me that the person, you know, who might normally be there is missing. And which is strange oh. considering how much work I do around portraiture uh, and even the yeah. composition. It, it, it's, it, was, it, it was so obvious. Like, I didn't actually think about that. I was literally, I was like just focusing on the, on the object. But then, yes, it's so obvious that that, that yeah, the, the 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 head is gone. The straps are hanging. It it uh, uh, yeah. No, I know. That's I, I actually I love I love uh, to learn about my own work uh, sort of after the fact. I don't. I don't want to say I don't put any thought into my work. I put a lot of thought into my work. Um, <laughs> I would say actually this particular type of work, this particular type of work I'm talking about, photographing of objects. I don't think. No, there's not a lot of uh, intellectualism that goes into it. Quite frankly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is why I think these works are particularly emotionally charged. Right. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is that something that is more like a like a gut feeling that you'd like to express and um, put I've never, in image? I'm or... not. I'm not one to try to impress with how clever I am. You know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I don't mind if somebody says you know that's clever, but I really don't go out of my way to make things clever. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of recoil too, especially in the art tech space. I think. There's a lot of that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it becomes less about the result. So trying to impress, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, it just, 
so I kind of stay away from that anyway, uh, as much as I can. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I'm creating. I'm, I'm, I'm working. Not as much, maybe as. Uh, I mean, I don't have a regular regimen or a schedule. You know, I don't get mm -hmm. up. Some, some people get up, I guess, every morning and force themselves to do work. I, I'm not like that. I, I sort of uh, st things stew and and uh, and then at some point after the stew has cooked long enough, I, I, I just work explosively and uh, wake up in a sweat and see what the hell I've made. Mm -hmm. We have a question coming through from oh. Chloe, who's um, one of our curators. She's asking, how has the way the reception towards your work changed from Potato 345 through I Am Coin and now uh, N95, if at all? Mm. Sure. Um, well, so I think there are, with respect to those who even know who I am at all, uh, I think the the bulk of people don't aren't maybe are not aware of the entirety of my work. Mm -hmm. I think there are those who know my photographic work, and yeah. there are no, those who know my my other work. Um, I mean, I, I'll come across people who think I only work in the crypto. You know, you're oh, you're that crypto artist, as mm -hmm. if that's all I do. Uh, I, there are people who think that all I do is installation work, you know, in public spaces. There are those that know that I photograph portraits of people, uh, but are unaware of the objects. Then there are people who think I only photograph potatoes. You that's, know, actually, so... that's actually really true what you're saying, because I heard quite a few people mm. uh, when mentioning your name that um, sort of, um, you know, said, oh, yeah, the photography artist or the, mm. the artist that worked. Yeah. Um, in different fields, so yeah. Sure. And so, I don't know why, but perhaps it's the way that. Um, I think it's how I think it's I think it's how people discover you, right? Uh huh. You know, for instance, you might you might have discovered uh, you know David Hockney through his uh, you know painting his pool paintings or his California early garden work, but you're mm -hmm. completely unaware that he has this huge body of work of Polaroids, right? Sure. You know, yes. um, stuff. I think it's kind of akin to that. Uh, so I, to answer the question of Chloe, uh, I, I think that uh, for me, it's important as an artist, not so much for the general public. Like I don't really concern myself with it too much, but with people who are, uh, you know, collectors of my work, I like them to understand how these different, um, these different periods in my career and different mm -hmm. disciplines actually, for me, are all one and the same. You know, I don't, so I don't identify as a photographer, first of all, any more than I think you, than you do or anybody else. I think we're all photographers. I, I, I really don't like being defined by that. And sometimes it comes off as uh, like a little strange, like, whoa, like, take it easy. But I, I just don't. I, I, I think um, uh, I was an artist before I started leveraging photography to make mm -hmm. art. Um, it, I just, it, I don't feel particularly inclined to define myself uh, by this, you know, Japanese machine that I use. Um, and it's, uh, it's just not, uh, yeah, some of my work, maybe a lot of it happens to, you know, use photography, but I also crypto just because I use cryptographic, uh, algorithms, uh, you know, to generate, uh, mm -hmm. proxies, uh, that I shouldn't be defined just just by that mm -hmm. um so i think it's important to sometimes connect people uh, to, for people to uh, to understand uh how a photograph of a potato and uh, a print of an alphanumeric or mm -hmm. uh, a neon sculpture of an alphanumeric or a canvas sack on the floor or a hundred oil barrels uh in the middle of a park in colombia how these for me are are they're sort of the same thing, just mm -hmm. with a different uh, visual Medium. or physical manifestation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do you think, like, this is a question I just had, um, how do you think is the best way for, for the audience, for example, to learn more about your work in a way that makes sense and that, yeah. that story that you're trying to tell through different mm. mediums is actually making sense, you know, it's part sure. of the same thing. So it can, I, I mean, that can be, I can imagine, if, if, if that were, that could be challenging in, mm -hmm. in my, in my, I think my path as an artist has been, um, it's not, it's not the norm. So mm -hmm. my background is science, right? My background is microbiology and cognitive science. Um, and yet I've sort of, even as a young child, always saw myself as an artist. Um, then I went through a period in my like 
not even preteens, going into early teens, where I became sort of uh, entranced with the, the, the kind of romantic notion of being an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, also, in some way, uh, for sure, uh, the power that an artist can wield um, mm -hmm. in surprising ways. I, I became really kind of, I thought it was exciting and I wanted some of that. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that included actually writing. I would have included that in that in that whole uh, in that whole fantasy. Um, so it was so it's very satisfying for me today. Even when I say that, I think about that. You know, I I, I I've managed. I'm sort of I'm at a level as an artist that I think is higher than I ever sort of uh, imagined. In the sense that, like, I can actually support myself uh, fairly well with it, which is something I never intended uh, that wasn't important to me um the uh i'm a little rambling off i'm getting all kind of like thinking about young kevin and his dreams but um you know there have been lots of ups and downs but mm -hmm. sort of art has always uh including like a period of being homeless and you know but there's always uh art has always you know been a big um uh it's it's the driving force but behind everything that that I do but again get back on track with with um with how how people can discover this stuff so i i didn't come up through the gallery system right um when i i think my my first attempt uh or interest potentially in getting like gallery representation was around 1990 mm -hmm. so i was just starting to make um a name for myself in Los Angeles, so between Germany and Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I was moving from around Germany, but when I was back in LA, um, I became uh, friendly with Henry Geltzahler, famous curator and best friend of David Hockney. Mm -hmm. And he introduced me to David and David and I did some kind of collaborative stuff. And the, the, the resultant photographs from that, that um, collaboration, um, he, uh, Henry Geltzahler was quite, uh, taken uh, by them, and he he and 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 uh, and a few other people, Dennis Hopper, uh, the actor who collected photography, he was another one. They they kept encouraging me, like focus on that, focus on that, because at the time I was doing mixed media work, I was doing all sorts of stuff, and so I I did. Um, so that was I, photography, right? And that was my my photographic work, right? Uh -huh. um, and and uh, uh, the point is, why did I get get into that? Um, Oh, so, so, so what happened is, as I started having some kind of modicum of success, which at the time, I, my, I guess those metrics, if you will, for success were, uh, I had some people that I admired and respected uh, complimenting my work. That was huge. That's the really better than that. Um, and then I was actually supporting myself. I was getting commissions to do work. Right, photographic commissions, mm -hmm. um, and so then. But remember, I'm a young artist, right? I'm like 20 years old, 21 years old, and yeah. and and I'm in London actually, mm -hmm. and you know I'm hitting up all the top galleries like Anthony Delphi and uh, you know all the big blue chip galleries. <laughs> Very naive, not understanding that uh, you know that you can't just walk in there and say, "Look at my work." But mm -hmm. more complicated, more complicated. Not just because I was a young artist, potentially, you know, not developed enough but i was working with photography and remember you know 30 years ago you know even you know 27 20 let's call it 27 20 years ago 28 years ago when i was trying to get into these galleries they you know you, you had photo galleries and you had fine art galleries photography mm -hmm. was still not being fully onboarded by you know maybe cindy sherman a little bit but for the most part it was this other thing. And this is my, this is to this day why I don't like being called a photographer, I think, <laughs> because it was so like, you know, it, and, and I've talked to uh, curator Hansel Rishobrist about this. It's a ghetto, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, the, 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 I think the very concept of, of a photography gallery and, the, and, the, and the, even photography fairs, it's, it's, uh, it creates this kind of ghetto environment um, that's hard to get out of, you know? Uh, and it speaks to, it speaks to uh, where your work fits in, in the sort of corpus of, of fine art. It speaks to the prices that you can charge for your work, um, you know, based on what is customary, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I just tried to stay as far away from that as possible. And right. in part, so, so I, and I think some of that led to me, um, experimenting with photography as well 
and photographic uh, ma tools, materials, um, and trying to get something out of it, uh, you know, adding, augmenting the photography with something to kind of, I, I started to resent photography because I just didn't like being called a photographer. Um, and so, so because I didn't come up through the gallery system, I, I, I developed over years collectors, but because I didn't come up through the gallery system, I think about the implications of that. Because usually, one, you go to art school. Two, you come out of art school, you do a group show, probably at the school you, you went to. Yeah. If, if, uh, if you have a little bit of buzz, you get picked up by um, a, a gallery to, yeah. as part of another group show. If you, you know, uh, impress everybody, down, yeah. they'll give you a solo show, right? Mm -hmm. And then eventually, then the bigger gallery says, why don't you come over to our gallery? And so, they and so you say bye bye. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. Right? and, and so, and then, and then one day there's this holy grail of you might end up in a museum. Mm -hmm. I had the weird, uh, uh, I had, I had the weird path where I, I went straight to museum very early on in my career. <laughs> so it's like, you know, um, but, but I also didn't have the sort of uh, infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, uh, that most artists uh, have, um, which is a team working around you to, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, pimp you out essentially, you know. And I say the word pimp, pimp out because I would say most artists going through the gallery systems, even the big names in some sense become whores, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a choice one makes, uh, you know, not to disparage uh, prostitution uh, at all. Uh, but, but I mean, it's not for everyone. And, mm -hmm. it, and it particularly wasn't for me. And it's not, it's not because I, I worried about, you know, oh, they're going to take half my money. I, I never care about stuff like that. If I have a piece of work, you sell it, you get your commission. But, yeah. but, but, but I will, what I will say, and, and I don't want to really call out names on this, but you can look at some very, very successful, famous artists, right? Mm -hmm. And I, and I'm only bringing this up because I, you know, I, I don't know if, if you know, but most people know I don't really like talking about the commercialization of work and and and, and money. I, I find mm -hmm. it quite vulgar. But what's even more vulgar than just talking about about it are when uh, you have artists that I think, you know, out of necessity, they enter into these agreements with the system, the gallery system. And because they decide I want to work as an artist full time. And if at all possible, I'd like to support myself through that. So they end up, you know, with these, with these agreements where they're making work. So you start off, I'll give the example I like to give is, so you're a young artist and you make 12 pieces of work. It takes you the better part of a year and you do a show, you do your first solo show. Wow. That's huge. You do your first solo show. It's exciting. And you know, there are, prices that are sort of uh, you know dictated you know well you're a young artist the work is this big uh you know uh you know you can't charge this much money but you know so your pieces are somewhere between twenty five hundred dollars and five thousand dollars let's say mm -hmm. okay? so it's kind of like and an average price i don't know let's just say that let's just say yeah. that and let's say five thousand you know yeah uh -huh. you're in a nice part of london and they're gonna slap it's five thousand quid on each on each work right yeah. And so 5,000, 5, you've got 12 works that you've worked a lot of. You spent the better part of the year. And mm -hmm. You have to support yourself. So yeah. you end up with 60,000 quid, of which the gallery is taking half of. So you've worked your ass off the whole year. Well, well first off, if they sell. <laughs> if the show sells out. If Charles Saatchi shows up and buys out the show or whoever comes and buys, you know. Yeah. If you sell out the show, you're sitting on 30,000 before taxes. And you're a sellout. You're an artist who just uh, you've just sold everything. So now you go. Now you're you go on to the next show next year. You work the next year. Price goes up, right? Ooh, hot artist, you know. So now you're selling for ten, fifteen thousand dollars. You make twenty pieces of work. But even at that scale, you're still struggling. Yeah, and you when have to does the make artist more. stop struggling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I know and this is the works. tragedy. And I think this dovetails nicely with where we are right now. <laughs> <laughs> where you don't even have that as an option potentially. Yeah. So I feel I'm fielding questions um, daily from mm -hmm. friends and some people that I don't know too about can we brainstorm? You know, do you have any ideas about how to survive as an artist when you're on lockdown? Hmm. When you and don't. How do even you think have... it could be sustainable? Like, have you thought of anything that could work? I mean, you know. I have people say to me like, well, Kevin, you know, if you could, if you, if you couldn't make art anymore, 
for whatever reason, or you went blind, or you went, I don't know, all these scenarios. If you couldn't make art anymore, you know, what would you do to support sure. yourself? I'm like, I would just do something else because mm -hmm. there are a lot of ways to support yourself. Uh -huh. Maybe one, one of, the, perhaps one of the hardest ones is making art. I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of, nothing's easy, but if, I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, choosing the, the, choosing art as a path to support yourself is not, I, don't, I think that's a losing proposition. If you manage to, that's great, you know? Um, and it also, I suppose, depends on what part of life you're in. When you're in your 20s, you can, you know, you can live like a cowboy. And yeah. you know, when you've got a couple of kids and this and that, you know, your choices have to be a little bit more practical. Yeah. Um, and then I think it also depends on where you, you know, so I grew up between Europe and America. I was born in Los Angeles, but I grew up between Europe and the States and England and Ireland. And, uh, you know, not a lot of state support in America, a lot more support for artists, say, in Ireland. And I know that when I meet artists in Ireland um, and France, for that matter, I spend a lot of time in France. We have a home in France. I, um, I meet artists who feel like uh, they are owed something, mm -hmm. you know, it's a debate, which I don't really care to get into. But I mean, but people who believe, you know, uh, you know, where's my money? Where's my money to make art? Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, I went to art school, spend, you know, in the States, you spend a lot of money to go to art school. Yeah. Uh, strangely. Um, it's and, kind of and, the same over here. That's one yeah, of the reasons yeah. why I moved to London and I, you know, a lot of people take ages to repay at school, so. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, it's, uh, so I mean, I, I, I feel for anybody who is just struggling, you know, sharing in the human struggle. Uh, but I certainly don't care. I don't, I don't shed more tears for artists. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I, I'm, I'm, I, whenever possible, I, I, I give whatever kind of advice or encouragement I can to, to artists who I feel are in it for the right reason. People who make art because they have no choice. They have to make art. Not, you know, they, it's an internal obligation. It's, it's, it's something that, you know, they, they would do. And they, yeah, if you can't find, you, they can't afford oil paints, well, then they use acrylic. And if they can't afford acrylic, they use watercolor. And if they can't afford, they use pencil. If they can't do that, then they have to go take mud. I know, you, you know, you know, same, I feel like, you know, I spent a lot of time growing up in Hollywood and you get the same thing there. You get, it's even more, that's really perverse. You get people who spend a hundred thousand dollars a year going to USC film school and then they come out and they're like, okay, who's going to give me money to make a film? I'm like, who the yeah. fuck are you? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a couple of comments uh, coming through, and uh, one was from Eleonora, um, and she's um, she agrees with you, but she also says that anarchy doesn't work as a anarchy. That's what she mentioned. Okay. Um, so she's uh, she's like, let's brainstorm because I think what she's probably trying to say is that. Um, what we are seeing, you know, in terms of the yeah. galleries and the system out there is not really yeah. going in support of mm -hmm. artists. Mm -hmm. So it's probably looking at what do we what do we do? How do we solve this problem? Like just to give an example, a few days back I was talking to an artist um um living in Berlin and they do um um Instagram filters, which is like mm -hmm. an AR that goes on your mm -hmm. face and then you can use it on different apps and Instagrams primarily, and they don't make any money out of it. That becomes sort of a, a Facebook uh, property. And so you can play with yeah. it, you can get the name and the visibility because of course people will tag on your account and your followers will grow um, and so forth, but there's no money. So it doesn't mean that having so many followers, 50,000 or whatever, 1 million, brings money or value to no, your work not at no. all so no it doesn't saying, it really doesn't what do i do it never like, did it never did back in the day we do, do oh the magazine we have a four million circulation you know we, we don't we can't pay you but we'll give you credit yeah you know, what my my father always said to me don't you just don't don't take credit take cash <laughs> no well, but i mean and yeah i you know that's that that's one of those things you learn as a young artist i mean i'm sure at some point yeah, I'm sure there are cases like, you know, I don't know, you take a good picture of Kim Kardashian and you become famous or something. I don't know. But like, you know, <laughs> which, by the way, <laughs> she's always my God, God bless Kim Kardashian. But she's always my my uh, my case, my, my 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 poster child for why 
um, uh, platforms that uh, crowdsourced curation can never work. Uh, and I always say, why? Because uh, what's going to surface to the top when you know the the, be the you know the best art is going to be a picture of her ass, you know, at the end yeah. of the day. And that's uh, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of crowdsourced curation, unless the crowd is curated. <laughs> is that elitist? It might be, but uh, <laughs> don't know. So Leonora, she's just uh, replying, saying that she totally agrees with you um, on the gallery issue, but we um, all still need a structure. No structure we, yeah. doesn't work. Um, yeah, we, yeah, structure for sure, right? But, but those traditional structures are being dismantled at a, at a wonderful pace. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's interesting to see what scaffolding is going up now, including this. I mean, I'm one of these people, you know, you, you throw me a lemon, I want to make lemonade. It's like, you know, I, don't you think that there's some positive stuff going to come out of this? Don't you think that uh, we're going to come out of this with uh, like this type of communication? Mm -hmm. uh, it will become even more natural. I mean, I know we're always talking on devices anyway, but somehow, but we don't do it with an understanding that that's the norm. Right? Yeah. Well, I or think, or that know, we don't have an option, that we don't have an option. Yeah, I think not having an option, as you were describing us, is not having tools to create. This is our tools now. This is the way we're communicating with each other because it's the only way. We cannot go out. We cannot right. keep that. Uh, we need to keep a distance with each other. So it's, And we know there's nothing better for art than when you impose some parameters. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> when you, you know, impose restrictions, it brings out the best in all of us, I think. It's pushing us to the limits. And I think that limit will be triggering a new way of exhibiting, talking to each other, um, but also um, sharing art in a way yes. and making it. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. I hope we will come out of this as better human beings. I truly- But let me throw that. something out. Let me throw something out conceptually because I think about yes. it all the time. Is it possible we're entering, not, not because this is, we're never gonna come out of lockdown, but is it not possible that we enter a new era? And I thought about this already with copyright, how copyright was being uh, subverted by, you know, Napster and, and uh, uh, what else? <laughs> Napster. <laughs> well, anyway, all the files. I do sharing. remember that. <laughs> yeah, that was a long time ago. Um, but all the file sharing, like, and, and I started to think at the time, so I'm 50 now, right? But even in my 30s, I was starting to question the nature of copyright based on what, you know, 17 year olds were, were thinking. Um, and, and so I, I thought, you know, just because I create something, does that, th th that doesn't mean that I'm, I, I should be the, the sole, I'm not going to argue about copyright, but it's, it's like, I start, I, I'm open to the idea that uh, copyright is a man-made construct. It's not, you know, given down from the heavens, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I, whether or not it should be absolute, I don't know, but in, somehow that's connected to this thought that I had that you know, we've had a pretty, some artists anyway, have had a pretty good run of it, right? Making good <laughs> money. Uh, they've been able to support themselves. They've been able to augment their income. Um, what if we enter into an era where art is just not something that generates income? Art is something you do because you love, to, you need to create art. It's an obligation, you need to. And you sure, you know, and the logic, logic follows that uh, if you're making art that moves people, that that somehow you know, there's a way to monetize that. Mm -hmm. But is that, if that, if that, if, if, if the money part of it disappeared, does that mean all the artists would stop making art? Mm -hmm. Or would we, or would only the hardcore artists still be standing? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna challenge your thought. Um, okay. And I wanna ask you, you know, with the all um, new blockchain system and the fact that now you can protect your work on the blockchain, um, still, you'll be able to share it with others, right? I'll challenge you right now on what does that mean? Protect your artwork, well, we'll get back to that, go on. Yeah, 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 of course. I'm more than happy okay. to have this chat. Um, you know, you can, yeah, you can store it on the blockchain, you can store it on the blockchain, but then you are free in a way to share it with your with your friends, family, anyone on the internet, because um, as I did with your post, for example, today I shared a, a photograph and I didn't um, think about royalties or copyrights as such. Um, right. How do you think the crypto space and the blockchain can come in support or in a way 
damaging yes. the copyright and the royalty system that we are familiar with, sure. you know, right. in the more traditional way of, yeah. of doing art and distributing art. Okay. Well, anybody who knows me knows I'm a, I'm a blockchain purist. I like, uh -huh. an unadulter I like an unadulterated blockchain that's meant to do what it's supposed to do. It's anonymous, it's transparent, it's supposedly it's incorruptible if everything works right. End of story, right? And mm -hmm. the, only, the only art on the blockchain is art that's native to the blockchain. It's actually on the blockchain. It's mm -hmm. not sitting on another company server and tied to the blockchain, but it's actually on the blockchain. Okay. So we're talking so, about art born on the blockchain. Yes, the, it's yeah. deployed to the blockchain and that's where it sits. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, anything around, uh, anything around engineering scarcity and rarity, mm -hmm. just for the sake of that, I think is absolutely vulgar. Okay. I think that when I think, then you say, well, okay, then how come that bronze sculpture you did, you only did uh, 10 of them? Well, I don't know. They're well, I didn't make any bronze sculpture, but if one made a bronze sculpture, uh, you know, perhaps uh, it's because it's expensive and there was, there was a limit to how many they could make. I mean, there are reasons we impose limitations, I suppose, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, on, 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 on an addition. But in the digital realm, the beauty of the digital realm is that you can actually, as you know, you, know, you, can, make, uh, you can make copies ad nauseum uh, that are identical. Um, so I think that trying to, you know, and, and these companies that sprouted up, most of which don't exist anymore. You know, after I started making news in 2018 with when I tokenized myself and all of my yeah. crypto stuff, um, uh, I received on average for the first couple of months, so it was February 2018, I started receiving four or five e uh, emails a day from companies who said, we're going to be the uh, de facto platform for digital art and collectibles. Um, and, you know, one was in New York and another one's in London, another one's in Croatia, another one's in Russia. And, and everywhere I went in the world, I'd get a like ambushed. Actually, they were seeking me out. I think, you know, could you, you, you want to put something on our platform, you know, to validate the platform. And they were essentially, it was all flavors of the same thing. And then there was a little bit of authenticity tied in too. And, uh, you know, um, and, and, and then that died down. But I lost count after about 220 of these companies, okay? Okay, a couple yes. hundred of them. I, most I, of, yeah. yeah, you know them, you know who they are. And most of, them, most of them don't exist. Uh, and and um, I look, I wish everybody well, uh, you know, but I, did, I, 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 I got a crazy feeling about this engineering of, of scarcity and rarity, just mm -hmm. for the sake of making money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing when Nike puts, and I don't talk about collectibles, but Nike uh, shoe come or Adidas put out a shoe. And they only make so many shoes because that's what the market will support at that price point. Okay. And then three years later, you know, they're not, they're not making that shoe anymore. That shoe goes up in value because people collect it. And it's, so that's sort of a natural thing. I mm -hmm. mean, they can game that too and only say, we're only going to do 100. You know, that's, you know, people, they, 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 they do that. But that's a big commercial entity, you know, playing games. I just don't think that those kind of games artists should be playing. Yeah, exactly. That's what I wanted to ask you next. How do you think this is going in support or not to artists? But you sort of gave me the answer. Um, but yes, yeah. I, was, um, I was curious to know how, how you feel perhaps about works that are, yes, on the blockchain or not. But the fact mm -hmm. that we now see the uh, copyright being less of a problem perhaps and we feel less guilty about sharing and posting things uh, because maybe we think well it is protected in a way so it is okay actually is it better for it to be distributed on different platforms or social media so that people see it more and mm -hmm. so the one the unique thing um, it increases the value its value but mm. is it or, or not? What's your feeling about it? For example, if you had your work, um, since you've talked about uh, when you tokenized yourself, um, if you had your work exhibited on so many platforms and being available on too many, um, you know, mm, platforms, um, how would you feel? Would that feel that your work was going to increase, not just in value, but just also about what it meant for people? Or, or not. Sure. And what's your tip for the artists, you know, the artists out there that maybe don't know much about what's been happening um, over the last few years? How would you um, advise them to approach? 
this Am market. I frozen? Who's frozen? Oh, you're back. Okay. So uh, you're buffering. I, I don't know if anybody can. I don't know if we're still going. Are we still going? Are we still going? You're going? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, I can hear you. You're frozen, but I can hear you. Okay, so so I think this comes down to uh, about whether or not people have a healthy or unhealthy relationship with art in general. Um, right. You know, you know, uh, people buy art for different reasons. I always say people buy art sometimes because they want to, um, uh, they, they like something, they want to uh, experience it on a regular basis. That's why it's on their wall. Or if it's not something you can see or touch, they want to exper share in the experience and hold that memory. They buy it as a so form of social proof and validation. You know, uh, you'll think I'm cool because I've got a- I own uh, this. Whatever. Yeah. Um, and then as an investment. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, people don't do it for the first reason. They do it as sort of a combo. You know, I've seen people buy things that they're, they're kind of lukewarm about. Yeah, I like it. It's, it's you know, uh, uh, throw it on the wall. It's not something I'm really excited about, but they'll buy it because somebody told them it's going to go up in value. And then I've seen people who really like something who don't buy it because they're told it's a bad investment. Um, and then I've seen people buy things they don't fully understand because they're, they're told that they're going to be perceived as super cool or they've somehow figured out that they are super cool if they have that piece of work. So, you know, and as soon as you're playing that game, then you care about things like, um, you know, how, Am I overexposed? So, so as an artist, you know, you know, here's the reality is that I do support myself through my art now. Thank God. Like, right. Not at the moment, by the way, uh, just like everybody. I don't think, I don't think anybody's going to be buying art for me for, you know, for months and months and months, by the way, that's, if they, if they do, that's great. But I, I can't imagine it. It, it, it. Well, I'll come back to this in a second, but think about okay. it. In times of recession and depression, uh, people with money are always buying art. In fact, that's when they're looking for the good deals. You know, that's when they're like, hey, Kevin, uh, you, you know, will you give me a discount or you throw one in and, you know, and I probably would, right? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, maybe just to spite them, I wouldn't. But now when people are worried about their lives, it's a different story. It's not just like, you know, they, they, I think when people are actually having this existential crisis, then maybe they're not buying as much art. So in that sense, I think uh, everybody's going to be struggling for a little while. Um, but... The thing is, once you find yourself in a position, or once you've engineered yourself to be in a position where people are willingly parting with money for mm -hmm. the, the art that you make, whether you like it or not, this becomes your reality. This is the real mind fuck, I think, for an artist, right? Um, is where that thing that you do that may come very easily for you it's sort of, it's like alchemy. Suddenly it's, uh, it's worth, you know, the cash or gold or whatever it is, some other instrument of value. And you, you can't help but start thinking about it. And this is the trap. It's a trap mm -hmm. that I try very regularly not to fall into, but I probably do. And that it's the trap of, um, you, you start to recognize that you're a brand. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of those things you're not supposed to talk about as an artist. That's tacky. It's don't talk about your brand as an artist. Mm -hmm. Don't talk about the elephant in the room. You're a brand, you know, you know, if, if, if uh, unfortunately, this is how most galleries see you, you know, they see you as a product. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, very brutal to say, but a lot of the artists selected by certain galleries are picked by the um, quotation on the market or how good they're going to do to the galleries. Um, as opposed to what is trendy or not. Yeah. And um, the brand is a fragile thing. I mean, in an extreme example, it's like, oh, you know, you can, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to call out any names for this example, but like, you know, you have a famous artist, oh, and then you find out he's a pedophile, probably not good for the brand. Boom. Okay, that's an extreme example. But, yeah. <laughs> and then on the other hand, you do something completely innocuous, seemingly innocuous, and these little things, they impact your brand as well. Um, and so then you have this space in the middle between, uh, you know, between buying, uh, <laughs> just trying to come up with a pun analogy, between pedophilia and, and you know, a, a, a slightly off tweet or something, you know, uh, and then all this space in between. And, and then you can't help uh, trying to make sure you're on the right side of things all the time. Uh, maybe you don't push as hard as you used to. Maybe in your 20s, things you would have said, maybe self-censorship, maybe, 
and, and that can be damaging. That can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I said something. I was. I, I like. I like this story. I, I. I don't tweet that much. I, I really not a big tweeter. Uh, I was at the Guggenheim for that show that they had recently that was curated. Every floor was curated by a different artist, Sai Gu Chang, um, Jenny Holzer, a few other people. But the floor that Jenny Holzer was on, it was, they were all female artists. She'd curated a, a show, just female artists. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm walking through there by myself very slowly and I'm looking and I'm having this thought that I've had before and I'm having again that the, the, that, uh, the, the art from female artists has, has been devalued for decades and decades and continues to be today. And I have this thought, right? And I think, and I, I don't know why I thought I should tweet it, but I thought I should tweet it. And I, and I, and I, I, thought, I, I thought, buy more art made by women, okay? Uh, and I, and I, before I sent it out, I thought, I gotta be careful about what punctuation I put on here. Maybe it's just a thought. I'm not telling people to buy art made by women. So I'm not even gonna put punctuation on it. I'm just buy more, it could be a note to myself. I don't know, just buy more art made by women. Mm -hmm. And I realized that what's the obvious? Somebody says, well, well how, how about just buy more art from artists? Yeah, okay, whatever. And I had a couple responses uh, where they conflated this TV show Fleabag that I like, and it had to do with, you know, infantilizing women. Well, the, t the tweet that somebody wrote was, stop infantilizing women and sitting them at the kitty table, right? Now, it's not like I had just given a woman a, 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 a gratuitous award. Mm -hmm. I was acknowledging fucking something that is a fact is yeah. that the work of women has been devalued and continues to be mm -hmm. right. And, and, but anyway, don't feel so. So actually I said to my wife, I go, I go, I go, um, shit, should I delete this tweet? I like, is this it? Is this the end? Is, is this like, have I just like, is everything going to turn bad now and I'm done? And she goes, no, don't delete it. I'm like, what do you mean? This could like, what if Rihanna like retweets it? <laughs> then the next thing you know, it's like, they don't even look at or what I originally said. It's just, he hates women. He's a misogynist. Yeah. <laughs> which is ridiculous because I, for a number of reasons, but um, the, and I did ignore it actually. I ignored it and it, it went away. It went away, <laughs> but, but it could not have. It could very easily with, you know, false outrage and all that stuff. That little thing that I did there could have cascaded into game over. Don't you think? I do. And I can give you another example that happened okay. to be, literally a few days back when I reached out to a number of artists like yourself saying, I'm going to start this series of talks because I think it's important for us to stay connected and to share art, you know? And in, <clears throat> in one of the messages I sent out because um, I didn't do the same message to everyone. I just, you know, texted people through Instagram. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I'm trying to support Italian artists because, you know, it's very difficult there. Um, mm -hmm. And somebody replied to me saying, don't be just in support of one country. Mm -hmm. Everyone is having the same issues, mentioning a list of other countries. Yeah. And I felt, of course, you know, I felt, okay, I am definitely mindful about other countries living similar situations and everyone is freaking out because, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Mm. But as you stated about women artists art, you know, that was a fact that Italy was number one on the list, unfortunately, for um, so many days. Mm. So, you know, I totally understand. And um, <clears throat> I didn't delete that. I didn't comment on that. Mm. I said, well, this is what is happening right now. So if you would like to be in support, then you're welcome. Um, yeah. If not, but... What I would like to share is that everyone has their own opinion, which I totally respect. Um, but it is a fact that women artists are less in terms of percentages of women that can Absolutely. support themselves through art. And um, apart from doing this with Magda, I also work at the Tate. And we do have um, targets on how women artists are represented and it's something that comes from museums you know national museums yeah. want to represent more women artists so it is a fact that museums and cultural institutions are trying to tackling and support um so i think we're totally in the right to say this is a fact and we want to do something to make it more equal um yeah no no you're no. back okay yeah, um, I'm, I'm here. I'm mindful about the time because we've nearly been talking for an hour. I, as you like. <laughs> I had one um, 
question really for you because I was interested about what we um, briefly talked yesterday and I was interested mm. about your relationship with technology and you said mm. that you like to um, sort of bend technology to what you would like to achieve as a, mm. as a result. So sure. I, I wonder right. if you could just touch on that and your latest project. Yeah. So, um, right. So it's, uh, a lot of the work I've been doing in the last, uh, well, last year, um, I'm, I'm leveraging technology that we all have access to, uh, uh, algorithms that, uh, uh, deep learning algorithms, uh, that where you provide data. Uh, in my case, usually it's photographic data. Um, it trains on it, trying to, un you know, to, in some way, uh, understand the nature of it, uh, maybe that's imbuing it with too much uh, intelligence. We're just talking about machine learning after all. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but deep learning is a little bit different. And, um, and then I, and surface insight. So here, here's the thing, is that I'm using technology to uh, help me do what I do, right? Which mm -hmm. remember, I'm trying to create these proxies to distill value. Um, and if I can use technology to help me look at things differently myself, uh, that that's hugely valuable. So a lot of the work I do, um, and and then sometimes in order to do it, I I have to uh, I have to break uh, the algorithms. And I, when I mean break them, I mean um, let's say that they're uh, efficient, effective. Uh, I I try to subvert that uh, <laughs> so that I mean I guess you say breaking, but I try to subvert um, its efficacy. Uh, so that I can see within the space of um, uh, accuracy and inaccuracy. And, and I work in a feedback loop where I, I, I use the technology to, to, to surface insights, which then change the way I look at something. Then I iterate on something. I feed that back and I create this feedback loop. Ultimately, I decide when I am. And this stuff isn't really repeatable. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's best described as ritualistic because <laughs> while I have a background going back in computer vision, you know, back to a long, long time ago, back to 1989, um, and I've been working with fuzzy logic and then uh, eventually what we now call deep learning uh, uh, for quite a while, um, I'm not trying to win a Nobel Prize. I'm really not trying to impress anybody with, ooh, look what I do. And so, so sometimes I get approached by those who are, who are doing work, who are you know, usually coming from the world of technology, mm -hmm. um, whose, whose ordinary course of work yields a product which is very ooh-ah, right? A lot of the visualizations associated with the work that people are doing at Google and, and, and other labs uh, and Stanford and MIT, um, it, the, 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 the product of their ordinary studies um, it can be visually very impressive. Yes. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's best illustrated uh, if you go to ZKM Gallery, the Center for Kunst and Media in, in Karlsruhe in Germany, and you look at a museum that's dedicated to this intersection of art and technology. Mm -hmm. And many of the artists who absolutely did what you'd consider seminal work, important work, um, going back, you know, to the beginning of the century, essentially. Um, the wor they were not prolific, many of them, right? So, you know, they were, they, were, they were technologists who had an impulse to create art. Um, some were more prolific than others. Uh, and today I'm seeing a similar thing. I'm seeing people coming from the world of technology who are... Uh, becoming artists and that's fine i'm not going to say you know they're not artists uh, i'm you know uh, but i tend to respect the ones that i've seen who've put the time in over time mm -hmm. who were who were also aware of where potentially they fit in in this continuum uh, of the tradition of making art i know as an artist that's very important for me it's important mm -hmm. so that i uh, i i see how we came to where I am, where I could potentially be going. Uh, I want to know if inadvertently I've done something that was already done. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of work that you see today that I swear to you, you go back to like the 60s and 70s that it's been done already. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's really, it's, 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 uh, 
And, uh, and, and also, you know, um, well, I'll just get back. So, yeah, so I use art in, in ritualistic, uh, seemingly sometimes impractical ways to do what I've always done. You know, that's it. Um, uh, with respect to blockchain and crypto, people are always like, you know, so uh, are you, what's your next crypto project? I don't know. You know, I, I use technology as it emerges in ways that I believe it can help me. Um,